Welcome to another Two Point Conversation. I'm Stanley Holmes with Sports Press Northwest, and live via the webcast is Steve Clare with Post America. And once Hi, again, Stanley. we have um, plenty to talk about, all things Sounders, all things MLS, and perhaps something from across the pond as well. So let's get right to it. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much, Stan. And so first off, Sounders and the victory over Chicago this last weekend, two to one victory. Let me just put it out there right now. Is it crisis over? I think that's a, I love a question with a premise I don't accept, Stanley. Last week we talked about whether we were one game before a crisis mm -hmm. and I said no. So I don't think there ever was a crisis. But I do think the only crisis might be in our industry that we now need to find another word to describe what the team are going through. But no, 10 teams out of 18 have a postseason. There's never a crisis this early. Well, let's, let's, let's think about that a little bit. Perhaps not a crisis, I'll give you that, my friend. But maybe we should think about the game itself and analyze it. To me, to use that overused cliche, I thought it was a real tale of two halves. The first half, I thought Seattle's offense was outstanding and O'Brien White, Zakawani, and of course Moro uh, Rosales were superb in various aspects of the game. The second half though was really quite a different story in my opinion and I really thought that defensively there were some serious lapses that could have easily made the game 3-2 in Chicago's favor. Obviously Keller came up with at least two world-class saves. Third one just a good save, but a little, again, concerned about the defensive miscues that led to the opportunities. And so uh, we're heading to Philadelphia, or the Sounders are heading to Philadelphia. They're 3-1-0. and oh. They just beat New York and shut them out. Uh, what do you think? Is, is the defensive issues a serious issue, or is it, was it just the fact that Chicago had two really good Uruguayan forwards that were a handful. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways that we could take a question such as you raised. They, they were very good, they're forwards. They already appear to fit in well for a team that has a lot of new players. I would have to say, though, for the first time, at least since I've known you, asking me for a tactical analysis of the game might be a little forlorn because you may have been quite lonely up there on Saturday. <laughs> I was down at the Brower end with the Emerald City supporters getting the view from behind the goal for the first time in many, many years. So I probably am on this occasion the best person to analyze the positioning of the two center halves. But what I can tell you, Stan, was the saves were fantastic. Casey was right in front of me when he made those saves. And although neither finish was perhaps as clinical as Casey might have feared, his positioning is as sharp and as smart as it ever was. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I, seeing the, the saves again, it just shows you how an experienced goal, goalkeeper of, of, of a world-class ability like, like Keller at age 41, where his reaction time perhaps is, is not as quite as uh, quick as it once was, but it's all about experience. He knows how to position himself. He knows from experience where he thinks that ball is going to be fired. And I think it all showed on Saturday. And um, if anyone was doubting that perhaps Keller was uh, losing a little bit of his mojo, a little bit of his athleticism and ability, I think he answered uh, those questions quite clearly on Saturday. I, I think really that the only person that ever doubts Casey is Casey himself. He's his biggest critic. But cast your mind back, maybe it was two, three weeks, he outsiked Thierry Henry on a penalty. This is a guy that when a forward is bearing down on him, he uses his psychology, he uses his experience to gain an advantage in a way that I feel, I've not seen any keeper do since the days of the legendary Pat Jennings, to be quite honest, another ex sports player. And I, I think that even if you're right, Stan, that Casey now lacks a bit in reactions, which is forgivable at 41, he sure makes up for it in knowing exactly where to be. I would agree, and I would add one more um, point on that, especially after watching the uh, softball match yesterday at, at the Sounders practice. Casey is just a friggin' fierce competitor. 
And I'm telling you right now, I would not want, I would only want to be on his t team if it was chess, backgammon, softball, soccer, I don't care what it is, count me in on his team. That guy does not like to lose. And it was fully on display yesterday as one expletive after another um, in the, when he was encouraging his teammates, many of whom um, were, uh, let's just say, challenged when it came to throwing a ball, um, catching a ball, and hitting a ball. But Casey, as the leader, captain, and someone who won't lose in anything, uh, he was uh, leading his group, and they actually won. No surprise there. And he was at the center of all of it. So, you know, there's something to be said about just being a fierce competitor as well. And Casey well, that reminds me of, I, I can't remember if you were about at the time, what I now call Casey's rant. After the Sounders threw away that 3-1 win um, at home to DC United in the first season for two late extra time goals, I was in the locker room after the game and Casey's just sitting there brooding. He's fully clothed, ready to go, but he's sitting there waiting. I, I think, I felt waiting to be approached because he had something to say. Now, you know as well as I do, Casey uses us, us writers, us journalists, very, very cleverly to get a message across. I was the only one, I guess, kind of brave enough to approach him. So I got the first 40 seconds of the rant before other people kind of started hovering around me. I looked in that man's eye. He was talking to me, but not looking at me. The message was straight to his teammates, knowing that we would deliver it. He knew exactly what he was going to say, how long he was going to say it for, where every subject, verb and object would go. And when he finished saying what he needed to say, thank you, gentlemen, and off he walks. Yeah, yeah, that's Casey. So, so although um, he has and he's a competitor, I don't think I've seen a guy that up close who's so in control of everything he does. Well, I think we also agree that, I mean, he's clearly the leader on this team. And, well, he should. As he should be. And I, I, again, what was fascinating yesterday was just in a different environment, okay, everyone's, of course, he's an American and he grew up playing baseball, playing basketball, so he's a little different. But in a different environment, watching him take command, take charge, just kind of reinforces just how much of a leader he is on the pitch uh, for the Sounders. One other, one other quick um, insight from yesterday. The other, the other, the other player who thinks he's a, a baseball player is, is uh, Ozzy, being a Cuban, of course, um, there's a there's a tradition of um, of uh, baseball players playing in the big leagues here, and he was a little dynamo at shortstop. He made a diving save, hit at least one two-run home run, and after everyone was done playing, and they played baseball, softball, the whole practice, and at the end, a group went over to start playing a pickup soccer game. So it was one of those you know relaxing practices. Ozzy was still working with this. They had this umpire that they brought in. Um, it was kind of an umpire, catcher, and Ozzy was still working on his uh, swing <laughs> after everyone else <laughs> was done. And, and then this Ziggy quipped afterwards. Um, he said something to the effect, the only thing Adrian has to worry about is that Ozzy thinks he's the new Ozzy Vizcaya, I think is how it's pronounced, who's a shortstop formerly with the Mariners. And he said, uh, now Adrian has to worry about um, his new contract because he wants a major league contract, as in major league baseball. Well, yeah, I, I read that, and I will say this about Osvaldo Alonso. I think one of my biggest journalistic regrets is that Aussie's first language is Spanish and not English, because I think if his first language was English, I think this fan base might be even more in love with him if there was more direct communication between the the Anglophone fan base, certainly in Aussie. Because I, I have obviously watched him in the old days for, in, when he played for the USL team in Carolina. And the guy really is a tremendous guy. And I've interviewed him sometimes with an interpreter, sometimes without. And I'm adding the interpreter was for him, not for me. The guy has a tremendous personality and a really great sense of fun. I agree. And a great center midfielder for the Sounders as well. So yes. he'll, be, he'll be put to the test, no doubt, in Philadelphia against yeah. the Philadelphia Union. They're three, one and oh, their best start in their, in their second year in MLS soccer. A very physical team. Peter Nowak's teams are always 
very physical, very compact defensively. They like to foul, as some would say, um, but you didn't hear it from me. And they also uh, have a, a, a hometown, former hometown player in Sebastian Latou. Your thoughts on the match and, um, and particularly any thoughts on, on Latou and how well he's been doing? Well, I think this is a good, good test for the Sanders because Philly Union, since they moved into that stadium, have actually done probably more than any club to make their home stadium a fortress. You keep on saying, hearing Zay Ziggy say, we must make Westfield a fortress. And then you look at the numbers, there's proportionately as good a road team as MLS has. And I think Casey said it in his throwaway line after the game on Saturday, Sanders are a road team. But Philadelphia Union have really got used to playing in that home stadium and making it a very difficult place to win. With three wins out of four, I think they start favourites. However, they have got nine points. Should the Sounders beat them, Sounders will move to eight and have a 2-2-2 two, two, and two record. I think this game is very important for the Sounders because they can level. They can level the playing field. They can actually now put a line under the start of the season from which they're back at square one, as it were by going 2-2-2. Two, two, and two. If they don't, they're still going to have more losses than they're going to have wins and still be playing catch-up. So, big game for the Sanders, but they're going to need to be hungrier. As for Sebla too, great person. I really liked him. He didn't make that many friends here, as I think is no longer a secret, though some of the other players, but he's found his niche in Philadelphia. He's found a coach he can work with, and you know, except when he's playing a local team, no, I wish him well. Yeah, I agree on on Seb. I think uh, you're right. He wasn't. He seemed to be an odder fit as the season wore on. Uh, that first year, um, it seemed like in the beginning he was, you know, widely embraced. Uh, he was cherished for his work ethic and his box to box running and his effort. But something certainly happened over the course of the season where he clearly fell out of favor. So. I'm glad to see that uh, Latou has found a home in Philadelphia. Uh, I would like I think, to, can, can I just interrupt yeah. and something you said there that I think is very interesting, he, he fell out of favor. Look at the two players that were brought into the USL Sounders in order to be MLS players, San Aniasi and Seb Latou. Neither of them are at the club anymore. Now compare that to what happened in Vancouver when they had the guy in, they had a sense of continuity. That there's how many on that USL squad still at Vancouver? 11, 12, 13. And I wager you there'll still be quite a few of them there in a couple of years' time. That's, so, a, that, that's a very good, that's, that's an interesting comment. I just think it's, a, it's two different types of systems here. As you know, and we could get into this, this is almost another topic. Um, Vancouver, you know, has created sort of a, a club system based really more on the European model of academy and developing players from within, and they've been doing that for a long time, well before they joined MLS. The Sounders, on the other hand, were a USL team um, that scrapped together enough players to play every year, and the roster changed. There was no Sounders Youth Academy, no Sounders system of uh, player development. It was just a team that they assembled. Uh, and I think, you know, it's very telling. I think your point is a really spot on. It's very telling in how the two organizations are, are really different in their approach to player development. One's actually doing it. The other one, I don't think is really knows yet how it wants to do it. Yeah, I, I think that you could possibly make the case where it was something that Vancouver always wanted to do. It was an afterthought here. But I mean, to be fair, I'm going to cut Adrian Hanauer a break because that, that year, 2008, was a very difficult year. He'd thrown a lot of money at the USL team. Right. He'd lost a lot of money. He and many others, especially Major League Soccer, didn't want a team at all in Seattle in that year. Right. They wanted a really clean, clean break. And Adrian kind of kept that team going out of his own pocket oh, yeah. as a thank you to that 3,000 dog hardcore that supported the sport. So I can't, you can't really blame him if what happened that year didn't fit. Oh, in no, w w there's no blame. It's just, it's just different approaches, and, there, and I agree with the circumstances are, are, are completely different and to some extent. But let's talk about that other team here in the Cascadia region, uh, south of both Vancouver and Seattle. And you are heading down to Portland tomorrow, I believe, 
and are going to experience the first home game for the Portland Timbers in their new Gen Weld Stadium. And you are experiencing it as a fan or as a as a um, slathering jackal. I mean, journalist. Oh, it's a journalist. Um, uh, last Saturday was an aberration. I'm going down as a journalist. And what I'm really hoping to do, Stan, is chronicle a bit of history. I will have been at all three home openers in Cascadia. Ah. And I want to, maybe we can come and talk to you about this next week, compare how the three went. I'm looking forward, obviously, I have a lot of friends down there, both in the Timbers Army and, you know, some inside the club themselves. Uh, it's always a chance to catch up. But more than anything, I'm looking forward to the fan atmosphere to see how they've made that leap from a very, very laudable, you know, USL crowd to go that extra mile and how it compares with what's happening in Vancouver. Okay, we're going to be wrapping this up, but before we do, I want I want you to just spell out the top two highlights that you expect to see down in uh, Portland. I mean, to me, uh, I in my favorite, and I wish I was there to watch it, is uh, I've never seen Timber Joey fire up that chainsaw and cut around the wood. Um, to me, that just is so unique. I don't think anywhere in the world has anything like that. But but let me uh, but go ahead. What what should we expect from that opener? I think the big key for Portland Timbers will be this: they have to not let the crowd's expectations of them make them nervous, because home advantage will be almost negligible there. Most of these players have never played even in the old PG Park, and they certainly not played in this configuration. And much can be said of their opponent. So they need to find a way to harness the energy in the crowd. And I think Spencer made a very, very good point today. He said there's only so much the crowd can do. He managed to, even this early in their history, he's, he's way beyond the pandering to the crowd and telling the crowd how important they are. He put it very straight. In the end, it'll be 11 against 11. But I do think this, if they do get an early goal and they get those nerves off their backs, they could get their first win of the season as well. And I think then there's no telling you know, where this team might go. I suspect that it may be an occasion too much for them. You never know. I don't like making predictions. But I think, really, this will be one of those days when you're old, Stanley, in many, many years' time, you'll be still talking about the day that Portland had their first ever home game in Major League Soccer. Prediction in the match. I hate doing this because... Can I tell you an apocryphal no, story by way of avoiding that. doing it? No, you're going to... Straight up. What's, All right, let me tell you the story and do it. Back in my hometown... They once made a documentary about Rangers and Celtic, and they interviewed both men, and they asked Jock Wallace and Jock Steen were the managers, and they asked them to predict the result of tomorrow's game. Jock Steen, the legendary Celtic manager, said, only a fool would attempt to predict the result of a Rangers-Celtic game. And they penned to Jock Wallace, who said, 2-0 for Rangers. <laughs> no idea who actually won that game as a rule I try and avoid finding out what happens in them or even watching but I will say this I'm going to make what I call a hope cast a hope cast is a cross between a forecast and what I hope I'm hoping that there's at least two goals for the home team and that Kenny Cooper gets one of them and that really we're talking about the goals in the football as much as the occasion or certainly not the referee all right, I'll be I'll be succinct. Timbers one nil. They're going to win their home opener. Uh, Steve Clare from Prost America. Thank you very much as always from um, from your webcast. I, I believe in your home. And uh, this is another two point conversation. Thank you all for watching.